Well, let's come to the Word of God this evening, and I'd want you to open your Bibles in Genesis chapter 12, please. Genesis chapter 12. I do thank George again for his kind words of welcome, and as ever, we do look to the Lord uh, to bless our coming together this evening. Thank you for coming out, and we do trust the Lord indeed will bless you and encourage you through the ministry of His precious Word even this evening. As George has said, the meetings continue uh, night by night at 8 p.m. Uh, tomorrow night we're going to look at the age of travel. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, said quite a number of years ago, and he said after reading a portion of Scripture, he said, I can foresee a time when man will be able to travel at 50 miles per hour. Now, when Isaac Newton said that, the fastest thing was a horse, uh, and so it was a big statement. Voltaire, a famous atheist, said that Newton must be doting because of old age. And the passage that he was reading is the passage we want to look at uh, tomorrow night. So we want to spend some time uh, tomorrow night at the age of travel. When we come to Thursday night, God willing, we're looking in the days of Lot. We really don't need to say anything about that. Uh, with the rise of homosexuality and all the laws that have changed, is there any significance we can find in the Word of God? And of course, we believe there is. And then on Friday night, we're going to look at the subject of the tattoo craze. Uh, even our former prime minister's wife had a tattoo on her ankle, uh, such as the phenomenon in the day and age in which we're living. And again, we want to see if there's any relevance or any teaching from the Word of God concerning that particular uh, subject. So that's what we hope to do uh, over the next few nights, God willing. Tonight, we want to look at the subject of the root cause of anti-Semitism, the rise of anti-Semitism, or whatever way we want uh, to put it this evening. Let's read in Genesis chapter 12. I'm beginning to read at verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We'll end there, and we do trust the Lord will bless the reading of his own precious, infallible, and inerrant word to our hearts again this evening. There was a survey carried out very recently. It's believed to be the biggest survey ever uh, carried out in the subject we're looking at this evening. Uh, thousands and thousands were interviewed. Uh, over 96 languages were represented, and they were trying to find out uh, throughout the population of the world how many would hold anti-Semitic views. And for those that answered the survey and working out in percentage, uh, they worked out that 26% of the world's population have some anti-Semitic Viewpoints. If we were to transfer that into people tonight, uh, that means that 1.09 billion people living on the planet have views, perhaps expressed sometimes, perhaps not expressed, but views that go against the Jewish people. 26% of the world's population. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in, in Europe. In France in 2014, 7,000 Jews left France to go back to the homeland, back to Israel. That's 1% of the Jewish population. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in Europe. It's on the rise throughout the world. It's on the rise in the United Kingdom. Uh, the Labour Party has been accused at times of uh, being anti-Semitic. Uh, they held a, uh, an inquiry recently, and they appointed uh, your lady Shakrabati to be the judge of this inquiry. A little known to uh, those that, uh, before she carried it out, that she'd been offered a peerage. Uh, and so when she said that there was no real evidence of, a, uh, of widespread anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, well, it looked just like a whitewash. I don't know where it was or not, but that's certainly what it looked like. But we don't have to go to the United Kingdom, the mainland. We don't have to go to Europe. We only have to go to Northern Ireland this evening. I remember a couple of years ago in Castle Court in Belfast, if you've ever been in the shopping centre, along the, the bottom floor sometimes there are those who set up these little stalls. And they would have been selling, uh, among other things, Dead Sea salts and 
different products from Israel. And some of the young Jewish students would have been there selling their wares. Well, there was an occasion when uh, some climbed up onto the upper tier of Castle Court and began to throw paint bombs at them. Why? Why did they do uh, such a thing? Our, one of our councils, the Derry and Straban uh, Council, have passed a motion recently uh, that they will not buy anything that's produced in the land of Israel. Uh, previously in Belfast, there were 17 graves of Jewish people, uh, and they were desecrated by a band of young people. The people don't know why they did it, but they just uh, attacked Jewish graves. Some believe it was in response to Celtic Football Club being fined because they had flown Palestinian flags in a, in a football match a, a against a Jewish football team, and they were fined by UEFA. And some think it was a reaction to that, so they thought the best thing they could do was go and attack some Jewish graves. Rabbi Singer, who's in charge of the synagogue in Belfast, said on the 2nd of October, just a few weeks ago, that anti-Semitism and an anti-Jewish feeling is rising in Northern Ireland. What is it about the Jewish people? Because this hatred for the Jews, this anti-Semitism, and you can read the websites on it, you can go to Wikipedia and you'll see that practically every country in the world, every country in the world has incidents of anti-Semitic behavior. Are the Jewish people such an obnoxious people? Is there something about them that makes them so hateful, if I can say that, I say it reverently this evening? What is it about them that causes them to be the object of hatred in practically every country in the world? We want to look tonight at the root cause of anti-Semitism. Even the United Nations recently, UNESCO, uh, published a report, and in that report they, uh, they said that Israel was an occupying force in the city of Jerusalem. If you read some of the judgments that have been passed throughout the United Nations, you'll discover by way, way above any other country, most judgments have been passed against a little tiny nation called Israel. Why is this tonight? Well, we want to look into Scripture this evening and see if we can try to determine the root cause of anti-Semitism. We've gone back to Genesis chapter 12. I want to talk about the promises. First of all, God makes some wonderful promises to Abraham here. In Genesis 12, you'll notice in verse number 1, he speaks about a land. In verse number 2, he says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. He promises Abraham three things. He says, I'm going to give you a land, you're going to become a great nation, and you're going to become a blessing. Indeed, they will become a blessing to the world. This promise was reiterated in Genesis 15, verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And there God identifies the land geographically. Uh, and he says, Abraham, I have given thee this land. And so God gave them a land. In Genesis 13 and verse 15, God says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed forever. God said this land, designated borders, this geographical piece of land, I'm giving it to Abraham and to the nation that will come from Abraham and his descendants. That Abrahamic covenant, the promise of the land, was passed on to Abraham's son Isaac in Genesis 26, verses 2 and 3. It was then passed on to Isaac's son Jacob in Genesis 28, verse 13. And so that promise has been carried down throughout the nation of Israel. Israel uh, has never possessed all the territory that God promised to them, but I believe in a day yet to come they will possess the land in its entirety. But God also said something else to Israel. God says, if you're disobedient, I will put you out of the land, and I will scatter you throughout the world. That's exactly what the Lord did. For instance, Deuteronomy 28, verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies, and thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and shalt be removed unto all the kingdoms of the earth. God says, I'm going to scatter you if you disobey my word and you disobey the commandments of the Lord. But that never annulled God's agreement with Israel. 
Yes, in disobedience they were out of the land, but God has promised them this land. And this is a land that has been promised to Israel. Promised a land, they promised there'd be a blessing. They were promised a king, and the king one day will come and reign in that land, and his name will be Jesus Christ. We'll say a bit more about that in a moment. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, in Luke 1, verse 32, uh, we read this, the angel said, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. You know, he didn't take the throne of his father David when he came the first time. He wasn't given a throne. He was nailed to a cross. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, he's going to occupy the throne of his father David. In Acts 1 verse 6, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ was about to depart, the disciples asked him a question. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time again restore the kingdom to Israel? With all the teaching that the Lord had given, with all, the, uh, all that they had witnessed, and nowhere in, uh, in Scripture, and nowhere did the Lord say anything about God's promise to Israel ever been broken or ever been changed. And the disciples fully expected that Israel would have their land, and that they would have a king. That's what God has promised to them. When we get into some other Old Testament scriptures, for instance, Isaiah 11, verse 1, it says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Again, in the same chapter, with, with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, the faithfulness and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall dwell with the lion, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. This has never happened. And for this to happen, as the Word of God has said, the Lord Jesus will have to come back. He'll have to establish his throne and reign for a thousand years. We read about it in Revelation chapter 20 during his millennial kingdom. For that to happen, Israel needs to be in the land, and the Lord Jesus will come and set up his throne in Israel, and Israel will be the capital of the world. So Israel in the past has been important in Scripture. Israel in the present is important, and Israel in the future will be important. Seventy percent of Scripture is the story of Israel. Israel will be at the center stage of events and end times. That's why Israel is so important. That's why it's important we keep our eye on Israel. And when we see a, a growing interest in Israel and in the Jewish people, then we realize that Jesus Christ is coming, and He's coming very soon. I just wanted to say something about the promises. God has promised them the land. It's their land tonight. Yes, they're in it. God has promised it to them. God has promised that a king will reign in righteousness, and the Lord Jesus Christ will come, and He will rule, and He will reign, and He'll reign from Jerusalem in a day yet to come. Remember the promises tonight. Let me say something about the persecution tonight. And I'm going to mention a number who persecute, have persecuted the Jews down through history, and in some indeed continues to this day, and, and give you a reason why, and show you a little bit of the theology behind it. You see, perhaps one of the greatest persecutions, and this is no surprise, comes from Islam tonight. Even though Jerusalem is not mentioned once in the Quran, nor is Palestine nor Canaan, uh, when Jerusalem was under Arab control, it was never the object of our religious pilgrimage for, for Islam. But tonight it's called the third holiest site uh, among Islamic people after Mecca and Medina. It was claimed that uh, Muhammad went back to heaven from the Dome of the Rock in Israel. Uh, this wasn't claimed until uh, between somewhere between 19 and 20 and 19 and 30. It was promoted by Yasser Arafat's uncle, uh, and they claim, they claim that this is one of their most holiest sites, and there's a reason behind it, because they want to hold on uh, to the Temple Mount, where God's temple once stood. But there's another reason tonight. You see, when we go back into the history of Abraham, we discover that there was a time when Abraham went down into Egypt. And Abraham brought someone out of Egypt, uh, and that someone was a lady called Hagar. And you know the story of Abraham and Sarah and how God had promised them a seed, but they became impatient. They became impatient with God, and Sarah says, go into Hagar and have a child by Hagar. And maybe this is the promised one that is to come from God. And of course, 
Hagar got pregnant, and Hagar had a son called Ishmael. But that was never the one that was chosen by God. Then Abraham and Sarah had a child, the child called Isaac, and we know already from Scripture that God said the promises passed down through Isaac and then through his seed right down to the nation of Israel. But as far as the Arab nations are concerned tonight, Ishmael is the chosen one. And Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations tonight. And so they say, if the land was to go to Abraham's son, promised by God that the land is theirs tonight and it doesn't belong to Israel. And because of Abraham's backsliding, there's still trouble in the Middle East tonight. Let me say tonight, backsliding is a serious thing for a child of God. And if you're not where you should be with the Lord tonight, you need to get right with the Lord because it doesn't just affect you, it affects other people. And we know that the Jews have known persecution from Islam. The Jewish people have known persecution from Catholicism. You see, the Roman Catholic Church claims to be the new Israel. They say they have replaced Israel, and therefore Israel have no right to the land. And when the Crusaders went out into uh, Jerusalem and into the Promised Land, they, uh, they were not only driving out the Turks, but thousands of Jews were persecuted and slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Crusaders. And down through history, Catholicism has been one who has persecuted the Jewish people. Many Jewish people have lost their lives at the hand of the Church of Rome. In 1243, an entire Jewish population of Berlitz near Berlin were burned alive because it was said they had defiled a consecrated host. 1298, every Jew in Rottening was burned to death on the charge of desecrating a sacramental wafer. In Degendorf, uh, again in Germany, an entire Jewish community were slaughtered for stealing and torturing a consecrated wafer. And on the church, on the Roman Catholic Church, they hang up a sign which said, God, grant that our fatherland be forever free from this hellish scum. And right up until today, the Church of Rome claims to be new Israel and claims to be the successor to Israel, and therefore the land doesn't belong to uh, the church. The land doesn't belong to Israel. Uh, the land doesn't necessarily belong to the Palestinian. But they say that the Jews have no right uh, to the land. And we could mention other things about that this evening. Islam has persecuted Jews. Catholicism. What about Protestantism? Well, their hands are not clean tonight. Indeed, if we go back to the time of the Reformation, there was much that Martin Luther did, which was good. And we have to thank God for him, for reclaiming the gospel and for the five solas, which we would hold dear to our hearts this evening. Uh, but Martin Luther brought some of this Roman Catholic theology with him. And he brought with him a, a theology that's known as replacement theology. And the teaching is very simple, that the church has replaced Israel. And because of how the Jews had treated Christ, there were some who felt it was right then for Jews to be persecuted and treated horribly. And this permeated much of Protestantism for many years. In fact, John MacArthur has written a paper on it, and he would suggest that when it came to the time of Hitler in Germany, it was so easy for him to, to annihilate the Jews because this teaching had been ingrained in many of the Protestant people in Hitler's Germany. As I say, Protestants haven't their hands clean tonight either when it comes to the treatment of Israel. This carries on today to a greater or lesser extent than some of the churches. The Church of Scotland had a meeting in May 2013, and they declared that Israel has no special right to the land of Israel to the land of Palestine. In spite of what the Word of God teaches, it seems the Church of Scotland knows better than the Word of God. And they say the Jews have no special claim upon the land. There are some within the Church of England that have had to have been disciplined because they've come out with some horrible statements. The Reverend Stephen Sizer, vicar of Virginia Water Church in Surrey, said that the Jews were behind 
He wasn't removed from his post, but he was reprimanded. And so there's been a, a history, a history of anti-Semitism going down through the centuries, right, until this modern age. Uh, we can go right back into what's known as the silent period, uh, when the Old Testament ended and before the New Testament began, there was a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, a man who was uh, on the throne, if you like, during the, uh, the Grecian Empire. He was a man that slaughtered thousands of Jews. He's a man who caused the Jews to disobey the Word of God, uh, and he commanded them to sacrifice sows. And you would know how important that would be to the Jewish people. We can go right up into A.D. 70 when Titus uh, marched upon uh, the city of Jerusalem, and one million, 197,000 Jews were slaughtered. We can come right up through history. We haven't even mentioned Hitler and the Holocaust. We can uh, come right up through history, and you can read about it on the internet. You can buy books about it, uh, and the suffering and the persecution and the anti-Semitism has been rife right down through history, and it's rising in the day and age in which we live. And we have to ask the question again. Are the Jewish people the most obnoxious, hateful, cruelest people on the planet? Why so much hatred for the Jew? You see the promises that God has given them. You see something of the persecution, and we're just touching the edges of it. But I want to come to the perpetrator tonight, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. What's the root cause of anti-Semitism? Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared, appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, we ask the question, who is this lady? Who's this woman? You see the word wonder there. The word wonder could be translated and probably should be translated by the word sign. It's not a literal woman. This woman represents or is a symbol of something or someone. Now, who does she represent? There are some who say she represents the church. Look at verse number 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Now, you know that that's Christ. And the church did not produce Christ. It was Christ who produced the church. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we can rule out the church. Church of Rome says this is the Virgin Mary. Uh, indeed, you'll see sometimes a picture of Mary with a halo and 12 stars, uh, and they say that this is Mary in Revelation chapter 12. Indeed, the European flag of the 12 stars, some used to think it represented 12 countries, nothing to do with 12 countries. It comes from this image in Revelation chapter 12. Remember, the European Union really is Roman Catholic European Union. And that's where the 12 stars come from. But can this be Mary? Look at verse number 6. Remember, this is the woman. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, and they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. You see that? thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years. Do you remember last night we mentioned the three and a half year period of the tribulation? And you see, this has taken place during the tribulation period. So you can't fit the Virgin Mary in here. You can't squeeze the Virgin Mary into the tribulation period. Look again at verse number 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Notice the woman is on the earth. The wonder was in heaven, but the woman was on the earth. Can it be the Virgin Mary? So this can't be the Virgin Mary. Uh, if you read books about Christian science, and I would recommend you don't, they claim that this is Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddy. Harry Ironside in his commentary uh, says, I'll not waste any time, uh, taking, I'll not take up the time of seeing people with such a ridiculous notion. I tell you, it's not Mary Baker, Eddy, Patterson, who was the founder of the Christian science movement. 
And so I don't believe it's the church. I don't believe it's uh, the Virgin Mary. And, and I think we can see who we can rule out. But who is it? Look again at verse number 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And here is this woman, and she's identified with the uh, twelve stars. Uh, it's very similar to the dream that Joseph had. And do you remember when Joseph told the dream? The, the dream was related very much to Israel in Genesis 37, verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren, I have dreamed a dream, and behold, the sun and moon and the eleven stars made obeyance unto me. And Joseph is a wonderful type of Christ. And if, I believe it was shown in a future day that, that Israel would be ruled by Christ. But I think there's more uh, would uh, confirm to us this evening uh, who it is. I believe this woman is Israel. If you look back into chapter 11, verse 19, you'll see that the Lord talks about the temple. Uh, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in this temple the ark of His testament. You have the temple, you have the ark of the covenant, and you can see God's beginning to speak about uh, Jewish things. Look again in Revelation 12, uh, verse 2. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Israel is pictured as a pregnant woman crying out in pain as she brings forth this child. Now, we know uh, that Christ would be off the seed of a woman from Genesis chapter 3. We know from Genesis chapter 15 he would be off the seed of Abraham. And then it's narrowed down to the seed of David in 2 Samuel 7, verse and I believe what you have here is Israel, and it was Israel that produced Christ when we think of a nation. I believe it's Israel. Look again at verse 3 in Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Here's Satan, and he's waiting for Christ to be born. And he's determined to make it as difficult as possible for Christ. And we know they tried to kill Christ. We know that Mary had to go as a heavily pregnant woman and uh, travel to Bethlehem. It was a dangerous thing, could have killed the child. And we know that Herod wanted to kill all the babies, and you can see that the devil was trying to, to destroy the royal seed. He was trying to, if you like, to stop Christ. He tried to stop his first coming, if you like, and he's going to try and stop his second coming as well. Uh, but I believe we can see uh, that this is Israel. There's a little uh, picture here, and I haven't time to get into all the detail this evening, but you'll notice what it says in Revelation 12, verse 3. It says, There appeared a, another wonder in heaven, and a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. See those seven heads. Over in Revelation 17, verse 3, we meet these seven heads again. And it tells us in Revelation chapter 17, look at verse number 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains in which the woman sitteth. And I know we can interpret that. But here's what the Bible says. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and another is not yet come. Now, John's writing during the Roman Empire. He says, five kingdoms have fallen. One is, that's the Roman Empire, and one is yet to be. I believe a revived Roman Empire. That's the time that Antichrist is going to rule and reign over the earth. But I want you to keep in mind these seven kings. And come back to Revelation chapter 12. Because these seven kings are important. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And I'm not going to all the details this evening. I just want you to think of these seven heads, these seven kingdoms. Five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to be. There's something that these kingdoms all have in common. These kingdoms all persecuted Israel. The first kingdom is Egypt. And you go back and you know the history, how the nation of Israel uh, were come into Egypt during Joseph's time. And you know how Pharaoh persecuted uh, Israel when they were in Egypt. And that was the first kingdom. Then the second kingdom was Assyria. And during the reign of Hezekiah, Hezekiah was, uh, was childless. And remember, the, the seed 
was going to come through. The royal seed was going to have to come through the king. Hezekiah was childless. Assyria had besieged the city. If Hezekiah had been destroyed, and I speak humanly speaking, there could have been no Messiah. You see, the devil tried through Pharaoh to destroy the children of Israel, that the Messiah would never come. Satan tried again through the Assyrians to try and wipe out the royal seed. Number three would be the Babylonish Empire. And we know the Babylonish Empire picked the cream of the Jewish children. Daniel was one of them and brought them into Babylon and tried to indoctrinate them that they may pollute the royal seed, that the seed may be lost. After the Babylonian Empire came the Medo-Persian Empire. And again, that's the days of Esther. And you know what happened during the days of Esther. You will know from Esther 3 verse 6 that Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. And again, the devil tried to wipe out the Jews. Why? Because he wanted to wipe out Christ. He didn't want the Messiah to come. And so he used the Egyptian kingdom, that was number one. He used the Assyrians, number two. He used the Babylons, number three. He used the Medo-Persians, number four. And then, of course, he used the Grecian Empire, which followed. And those were the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, which we've already mentioned, when he slaughtered thousands and thousands of Jewish people. Then we come to John's day, the sixth one, the one that now is. And that was the Roman Empire. It was Caesar Augustus who gave the decree that all the world was to be taxed, and a heavily pregnant Mary had to travel on a donkey to Bethlehem. It was Herod during the reign of the Roman Empire who, who sought to have all the babies drowned and destroyed. Again, that Messiah may be destroyed. And when we come to the seventh great kingdom, that's going to be a revived Roman Empire, I believe, and I believe we see the framework of it in the European Union. That's not my subject this evening, but I believe they too will persecute Israel. Now, if you're still in Revelation 12, look at verse number 5. And she brought forth a man-child, this is Israel, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. She brought forth a child... The devil couldn't stop the incarnation. Couldn't stop it. Because God's in the throne. When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth a son made of a woman, made under the law. And of course, you, you see also in verse number five, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. You know, this takes us into his millennial kingdom. The devil couldn't stop his incarnation, and the devil won't stop his coronation. But that doesn't stop him trying. You see, what the devil is trying to do, he sought to try and stop Christ uh, coming the first time. He wants to try and thwart, thwart Christ uh, coming uh, the second time. Uh, but of course, he's going to fail, but that won't uh, hinder him uh, from trying. Now look at verse number 6 in Revelation chapter 12. We're looking at this woman who I believe is Israel. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her, a thousand two hundred and three score days. Again, that's the three and a half year period, and I believe God is going to protect Israel during the tribulation period. Look at verse number seven. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And of course, the dragon is Satan. There's going to be a war in heaven. He's going to be kicked out of heaven. Uh, verse number 8, and he prevailed not, neither was there place found any more in heaven. He's defeated. Look at verse number 9, and the great, red, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And of course, the devil's not happy. Uh, we know from verse number 12 in Revelation chapter 12, he realizes he has a short time. This is during the tribulation period. The devil is cast out. Remember, he had access to heaven. We know that from the book of Job, uh, where he had that access. He's cast out. He's thrown down onto the earth. He's absolutely fuming. He knows he has a short time. What does he do? Look at verse number 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. See the word persecuted? It means to hound, to hunt, to flee after. Israel was going to be hated and hunted on an unprecedented scale. I believe God's going to help her. 
Look at verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of her great eagle, that she might fly to the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, a times and a half a time. And again, if you tie that in with the book of Daniel, that's the three and a half years of the great tribulation period. But I want you to see during the tribulation period, Satan is cast down out of heaven. He's on the earth, the place in heaven he had access to. He's thrown onto the earth. He's absolutely furious. And he turns up the heat, and he turns up the heat on Israel. And this is the last throw of the dice for the devil. If he can wipe out Israel, if he can take them off the face of the earth, then Christ has no people to rule and reign. And Christ will have no land to reign over. And so he's trying his dirty best to wipe out the Jewish people that Christ's second coming could be thwarted. Look at verse 15, Revelation 12. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away with the flood. Of course, the flood here is symbolic. Sometimes a flood speaks of trouble in general, Job 27, verse 20. Sometimes it speaks of warfare, uh, Jeremiah 46, verse 8. Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he said, I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Perhaps even a flood of propaganda, but Satan will turn all that he can muster and everything that he has against Israel to wipe them out. But of course, God's protecting them. God's looking after them. But it won't stop them trying. I believe tonight, when you see an increase in anti-Semitism, I believe the root cause of anti-Semitism is Satan. And I believe the devil is putting it in the hearts of people to turn against tiny Israel. Israel are in the land. Everything points to the soon return of Jesus Christ. The devil knows he has but a short time. And I believe he's tightening the screws and he's turning up the heat. And if he could, he'd love to wipe out Israel. And you know the neighbors around Israel would love to annihilate Israel tonight. If you've ever watched the BBC Question Time, sometimes I watch it and you get the politicians and when a question comes up about Israel, you can nearly hear the devil hissing. You could nearly touch the hatred that there is for Israel. And as we say, a rise in anti-Semitism, even in our own province, I believe the devil is turning up the heat because he believes that Jesus Christ is coming and is coming soon. Look what it says in verse number 17, just at the beginning of it. And the dragon, that is Satan, was wroth with the woman. He's mad at Israel. And he's mad at them tonight. And he'll do what he can to persecute Israel. You see the promises tonight. God said, you're going to have a land, you're going to have a king. You see the persecution. Some have moved away from that teaching. Some have teaching this contrary to it. And you can see how it has bred persecution down through the centuries, right up until this modern day. But I believe you see the perpetrator of it in Revelation chapter 12. I believe we can see that behind the persecution is the great persecutor, the old dragon, the devil himself. Let me say something, not only about the promises and the persecution and the perpetrator, let me finish off by something what I've called personal this evening. The devil tried to thwart Christ coming into the world the first time. The royal line at times was down to, to one little baby. Remember the degree to go to Bethlehem. Remember the order to destroy the, the male children. And there was a, an attempt by the devil to stop the birth of Christ. And there was an attempt even to wipe him out after he was born. And the devil's going to try and stop Christ coming a second time. Of course he's going to fail, but that's not going to stop him trying. If he can at all stop him coming, but Israel's in the land tonight. The Jewish nation has survived, and it's a miracle tonight. You know, in 1918, there was barely a Jewish citizen in Jerusalem. If someone had told you one day there'd be a Jewish nation, the, 
they would have laughed at you, but you know, God brought them back into the land. And they're in the land tonight. And the scene is set for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. And the devil is turning up, turning up the heat tonight to try and, if he can, thwart Christ coming the second time. But of course, he's going to fail because our God reigns. But let me tell you something else. The devil tried to stop Christ coming the first time. The devil will try to stop Christ coming the second time. You know something else he'll try and do? He'll try and stop you coming to Christ if you're not saved. Because the God of this world, that's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them but believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He, he wanted to stop Christ coming the first time. He'll try and stop him the second time, but he doesn't want you to come to Christ tonight. How successful has he been with you? In Luke 8, verse 12, the Lord Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seed. He says, These, those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The devil believes you could be saved, even if you don't believe it tonight. And so that's why when the word of God is taught, he comes and he steals the word out of your heart, lest you believe and be saved. He wants to stop you coming to Christ. He couldn't stop Christ coming the first time. He won't stop Christ coming the second time. Praise God. But listen, he's doing a great job of stopping you coming to Christ. Don't let him have the victory. And make sure you trust Christ as your Savior tonight. You know, Jeremiah 31, verse 35 to 36 are, are wonderful, wonderful verses. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves are off roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. What the Lord really said, there's more hope of the sun dropping out of the sky and the moon falling out of the sky than there is of, of Israel not being a nation. God said they're going to be a nation. If I was speaking to Hamas tonight, I would tell them they may as well fire the rockets at the moon as fire them at Israel because Israel's look, God's looking after Israel. And God's going to have them there so that Christ's going to come and Christ's going to rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem. I believe anti-Semitism is on the rise because the devil knows that Jesus is coming. And he knows he's coming soon. Do you know it tonight? If you're a believer tonight, it should affect how we live. We should be living in the light of his return. If you're not saved tonight, well, it's simple tonight. You need to be saved. And you need to be ready. Let's bow in a moment's prayer.